We'll see if anyone believes me. Um, all right. Um, let, let's summarize what, what we've covered in the first couple of, of classes. Um, I always like to do this. I, I, I joke sometimes that I like to, you know, one of my favorite TV shows was the spy show Alias. It was on a few years back. And, and Alias, at the beginning, they always sort of recapped what happened in the last episode so you knew what was going on in case you missed it. And then they have the episode. And then they always have a cliffhanger to make you want to come back, you know, next week and watch it. Well, I try to do the same thing, you know, do a little recap, so to refresh your memory of where everything's at, um, have the class, and then hopefully have a cliffhanger so that you'll really be itching to come to class on Thursday. Um, our topic last week was initially starting off talking about dynamic web uh, sites, or another way to put that is websites that use scripting specifically server-side scripting uh, for processing. We distinguish them from, from standard, just plain old static HTML sites. And we said with scripting, you have a lot more flexibility and you can achieve a, a way much higher degree of functionality. Because you actually have a programming language behind it. So you can do different things depending on circumstances. And you can access databases, and you can access user input, and, and all sorts of things uh, that, that are great you can do uh, to do that. And specifically, our platform is ASP.NET. All right. Um, we, we talked about ASP.NET being a framework. And we defined a framework as really a set of components that um, ultimately uh, is meant to make your life easier. Uh, the idea is, is that many uh, pieces of functionality that uh, are very common to web applications. There is an ASP.NET component for, and that saves you the trouble of having to do it yourself. All right. And we went over a couple of examples uh, just, to, just to sort of get the idea of it. Um, we went over uh, the calendar control, and we went over the validation control. And one of, our, one of our observations was we do have to keep in mind that no matter what's going on on the server, it's creating HTML, JavaScript, and CSS on the client side. The server does its thing on it and then sends the, the client HTML, JavaScript, and uh, CSS code. That's important for a number of reasons, among which is um, for, that has implications as far as styling. You know, you need to sort of know the HTML is going to be produced to be effective in, in applying CSS code um, to it. All right. We talked about all the advantages, how it does a lot of the work for you, how it should simplify testing, and, and a lot of good things, uh, a lot of good things should, that should happen. Someone asked at the very end of class last time a really good question, and that is, are there browser compatibility issues associated with ASP.NET? And, you know, I'm a teacher, so I don't have to give a straight answer, right? Um, the answer to that is, well, there's no browser compatibility issues because of using ASP.NET, because all that code runs on the server side. That being said, I sure can't guarantee that every piece of HTML that an ASP.NET control generates in conjunction with some CSS code that you have written and other things is going to be cross-browser compatible. So you're really back to, you know, square one. You know, you need to test it, all right? And you need to test the code across platforms uh, uh, to ensure that. Again, the browser compatibility issues that will be introduced won't be because of using .NET. It will be because of the HTML that the .NET platform generates. So bottom line is you still need to test. Um, all right. The real fun starts with these controls when you can start to program with them. And by program, I mean to write instructions in some programming language that accesses these controls and manipulates them. All right, that's where really the fun comes in. I mean, the, the controls by themselves, yeah, they're 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 nice. They they provide a, a little shortcut to do things quickly and more efficiently. But really, the biggest benefits come in when we can start attaching code to them and using our code to access and manipulate them. So. Here's what I like to do today, and, and I want to preview the functionality of what we're going to create today, and then we'll actually go and do it. All right? So we'll do it in a, in a couple, couple different steps. 
And uh, this being an example, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to uh, worry about making it look perfect, but we will spend some attention looking, uh, spend uh, some time and some attention looking at the, the styling uh, of the code. Um, so, what I want to do is something like this. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how we're going to build this. Because we're going to start simply and then we're going to build. We're going to make a little online quiz. And by little I mean one question. It's pretty little, right? Uh, but it should be enough to demonstrate all the stuff we're going to do. Our page is going to look something like this to start out. We're going to have some math problem, let's say an addition problem, then a text box for you to put in their answer, and then a button to say go and uh, check. And we'll then have a label that will say that the person got it right or wrong. We might even style the label differently depending on whether they've gotten it right or wrong. All right, Might show it a different way. We actually could, and again, depending on time and, and questions and whatever else anyone uh, feels, uh, feels like doing, we could even do something like put an image. You know, put a different image if they got it right versus they got it wrong. You know, put a star if they got it right, put a, uh, you know, a thumbs down if they got it wrong, or something along those lines. That's what we're going to start out doing. Then, we're going to add some validation to this. So that they have to put in an answer and it has to be a number. We may change the order. I'm just sort of describing the different stuff we might, what we're going to do. We might do it in a slightly different order than I'm describing. Then, we are going to add a button to show answer. So if you're really stumped, you can click the show answer button and see the answer in a label. All right. Then we are going to add the ability to choose the type of problem that you have. Maybe addition, subtraction, and so on. Given the fact that this is just an example, I don't, I don't feel obligated to dot the I's and cross the T. So we'll, we'll look at this and, and uh, again, if, if we, we uh, cut some corners, uh, we'll do that. But we should be able to demonstrate a lot of different stuff um, using this. Now, some of the things that we've seen, we've seen already. All right, some of the things that we will see, we've seen. Some of the things we've seen, we've seen already. Some of the things we will see in this example, we've seen already. For example, the text box, the button, I believe are all controls that we have used before. Um, the label, I'm not sure if we had any labels before. We might have. I don't remember. We had validation controls, but I don't think we had all the validation controls that we're going to use in this example. Because we're going to check to make sure um, that the user types a value in and that the value that they types in a number. So we'll do a couple different kinds of validations on that. But probably the biggest thing that we did not do before, all right, that we're going to do now, is the behavior associated with this. In other words, when you click the button, it goes out and checks your answer and tells you if you're right or wrong. Or if you click the show answer button, it shows you the answer. So those are the kinds of things that, that are sort of new in this example. Um, later on, at the very end, where we have a different button to show addition problems and subtraction problems and so on, um, we're actually going to use the ASP.NET control of a panel, which really makes it very easy to show and hide a bunch of things all at once. So we'll, we'll see uh, an example of that um, towards the end. And again, this may extend in the next class, but you know, we'll see how it goes. 
All right. Any questions about what our aim is here? All right, let's go in and let's make this. So I will go. If I was smart, I would have started a Visual Studio before class started. And so we wouldn't have two minutes of watching the logo. It is a very nice logo, though. Notice how it's not completely rectangular. It's, it's uh, irregularly shaped. That's, that's a nice feature for that. All right, just to review what, um, what I'm doing for here. I'm going in, I'm going to say File. New website. It'll ask me where I want to put it. Again, it's it's uh, nice that we can just really put it anywhere we want to on our disk, and you can put it on your thumb drive or whatever. All right. Um, and I'm going to pick an empty website. All right. And I'm going to put it on the desktop, simply so it's easier to find. And I will call it Quiz. Click open. It doesn't exist. Yep. And we'll click OK. Notice that we are using Visual Basic for this. Um, we're using a file system as opposed to a web server somewhere um, out there. And I'll click OK. And it's going to make for us our folder. Because we picked empty website, it is going to generate um, the website and the only file it will create will be the web config file. If we look over here, web config file. Now, I'll sometimes call this the, the application folder or the websites folder. Um, if you're not sure what I mean, know that that always means the folder that has the web config file. So that's what you need to zip up, the folder that has the, the web config file. Not just the contents of it, but the folder above it. So, if this was our assignment, we would zip up that folder and upload it. All right, so let's go in here and let's create a new file page. And we'll pick a web form and we'll call it default. Um, again, you should have one page in your application called default that's considered to be the application's home page. Place code in a separate file. Again, we're always going to check yes. I know in the book I think there's at least a couple examples where they don't check yes, but we will. Select master page. <coughs> we're not going to do anything with that now. That will become very valuable later on uh, in the term. All right. So remember, we can, we can operate two different modes actually three different modes. We can, we can have a code view where we see the code and essentially we just have a text editor with a nice IntelliSense built in. We can go into design mode where we have sort of a WYSIWYG and we um, can operate in split mode where we, we see a little bit of each. We'll sort of bounce between modes as just make, seems to make sense. Um, one thing I would say, again, is, um, what was I going to say? You know, some things simply go, seem to me to go easier in one versus the other, so that's why I do it. Uh, you should be aware of both of them. This is kind of a smaller screen, um, so that, that may affect how I uh, go into certain things, because uh, we really can't see a lot, of, a lot of code at a time. I'll go in, put a title in. All right. I'm going to go in and put just the three basic, um, let's see, one, the label. yeah, we'll put the label, the text box, and the button in there. And I'm dragging them in here. I, again, I could use the GUI view if I wanted to. 
I'm going to give the, the, the label text box and buttons their um, appropriate um, their appropriate uh, labels, their appropriate names or IDs rather. So I'll say label question. txt answer button check because the label is going to contain the question, the uh, text box for the answer, and the button is to go ahead and check. Uh, it's good to, to change the names of that. A lot of times I'll see where students will have, you know, text box one, text box two, text box three. They look at their code, they're trying to do something, and what's in text box 38 again? You know, who knows, right? So it's good to give them somewhat descriptive names. Sometimes I don't always give things names if I don't think I'm going to plan on programming anything with them. For example, if a label is just a static label with text, I might just leave it as label one. You know, if you're going to cut corners, that's where to do it. Certainly anything that you're going to code or program, you should, you should give a descriptive name to. Um, I'm going to go here and put 7 plus 5 equals. Alright. And I'm going to change the text of the button to say check answer. Alright. Again, we can view this in design view and see what it looks like. Alright. At some point we'll add some CSS styling to it to make it look nice. Alright. That's how it looks. Now, I'm a firm believer in doing just a little bit checking it, and then moving on to the next step. Um, I see students every semester with this mass of code, of, of, of all these lines of code, and they wonder why it doesn't work, and they went in and they tried to do the problem all at once, and they're running into difficulties, and it's very hard for them to determine exactly where it went wrong. Especially if they actually have maybe a couple different problems, right? Because they might change one thing and it might not give them the right answer and they might think, oh, that's the wrong change. When actually that was part of the right change, but they needed to change something else too. Right? So I'm a firm believer, especially as you're getting familiar with the platform, of just doing a little bit, testing it, and then moving on to the next step. All right? That works, that, that, that's good for so many reasons. It's good for your attitude. You know, it's better to leave the day knowing you got at least something done, even if it's minimal, <laughs> all right, than to leave the day and you just have a, a mess of code that doesn't work. It's easier for debugging. It's just all the way around easier. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to go and run this and make sure the question and the answer appear just like I asked. Now, it's not going to check the answer. It's not going to show me if it's right or wrong. It's not going to do any validation. But at least I can make sure it looks the way that I would expect it to. And I go and run this, and sure enough, we'll see it looks the way that we want it to. Those of you watching at home can use YouTube's little fast forward scrub dragging thing to go ahead a minute or two. <laughs> and there we go. All right. So nothing happens, right? But our page displays and and it shows the way that we look. I, at this point, I'm going to do a little bit of styling, but maybe later on when we get into the panels, we'll worry a little bit more of the styling. Now, one observation I want to make, all right? 
let's imagine this is the first time. I requested a page, the web server did its processing and delivered the page. If I type in an answer and click submit, click that button, by watching down here and by sort of watching at the behavior, notice what happens. It flashed real quick. It went back to the web server. So every time I click that button, it submits it to the web server. And the web server now has a chance to run some code and like check to make sure I got the answer right or whatever. All right? So it's important to sort of understand this form cycle. Um, in, the, in the ASP.NET form model, the forms work via what are called postbacks. And by postbacks, it means that the form posts back to itself. So really, the form sort of works in two different modes, if you will. And sometimes it's important to know that. All right? There's the form as it initially loads, and then the form after you've submitted it and some processing that happens. So the form exists really in two different modes. Now, like in HTML class, you might have had forms where you had a form that submitted to a different page, where there was an action, or maybe in, in 232. All right? This is the same thing, except the action is the same as the original page. So it effectively submits it back to itself to be processed. And we'll see examples of that going forward. All right, let's put a little bit of styling code on it. Um, I just want to create the CSS file now to make sure later on I can add stuff to it. So I'll go to File. Style sheet. And I'm just going to do something with the body to give it a background of um, pound. Should be a nice light blue. And then I'll go to the default page and I will associate that CSS file with this page. And now if we look at this, we should see the blue. All right. Let's actually lighten that up a little bit so the text shows up a little better. All right, there we go. Now we're going to put validation controls on here. And the one thing that I mentioned last time is really each validation control just does a little piece of it. You know, you, so you, you're, you're apt to have multiple validation controls for a given control if you want to validate a couple different things. So in this case, I want to validate to make sure that the user has put something in there. So I'm going to go and validate and put a required field validator in there. I'm also going to go and put a validator to make sure that the user has put in an integer. All right, so that they, they, they can't put in, you know, letters or whatever. And in fact, I will restrict them to just integers because this is supposed to be just a basic integer math test. So required field, again, you can go and choose required field validation validator. And I'm going to go change some of the properties down here that says must enter a value. I'm going to do a little trick. I'm going to make this from static to display to dynamic. And what that will do is that will, it will not take up any space if there's not an error. So the errors won't, you know, I'll, I'll show you what that means in a minute. It's, it's easier to show than to describe. All right. 
Now when you specify a validator, you have to say what control you want to validate. In our case, we really only have one control you can validate, but you still have to say it. I am then going to go and pick a compare validator. And you can actually use a compare validator to compare several different things. One thing you can do is make sure that one field is greater than or, or equal to or less than or equal to or whatever another field. For example, if you are entering a range of dates, you would want to make sure that your second date was later than your first date. All right. Um, so you could do a validator to make sure that the second date was greater than the first date. One of the things that you can do with a compare validator is, oops, you can do a data type check. And the data type check will check to see that the data is of a certain type. What type? Well, I'm going to make sure that it's an integer. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to set both these validators to have static as their display type so we can see how that works. All right. So if I go and run this, If I don't put anything in, it says must enter a value. If I put some garbage in, it says must enter integer, but it says it way over there. I really, the reason is, is that error message for the required field is taking up space on the screen even though there's nothing there. You can get around that issue if you change this to uh, the display of dynamic. So if I go in here and say display dynamic, then we can go and the R messages stay nice close to each other. Yes? Is there an easy way to do those forms? Repeat that, please. The error message, is there a way to link them up so they all come out? I mean, pop out of some of their needs, where they decide that you can them on? Yeah, you, there's actually a, a error summary that you could go and you could, you could put those instead of if you didn't want them next to that. We, we can take a look at that either in this example or later on. Other question? Okay. What you can do is... Uh, where is it? Validation summary. So you could put that error message somewhere and then it, it would show there. I generally speaking like to put the error messages right next to the field that has a problem. Again, that's a, that's a case that your mileage may vary. A lot of flexibility you have with that. Um, yes? So if you're going to put it on the uh, validation summary or the error message, uh -huh. so you can design it on the page where you want, let's say, join it on the right hand side. Right. Correct. Correct. Now let's put a validation summary here. So we can kind of see what uh, it would look like. So if we go and run this, then we actually get the error in two places. And then we could use through CSS styling, we could choose where to put it. Yeah. Now this one isn't the best example because there's only one error I could get, right? So therefore, um, but if we had a bigger form that had several different fields, we could put that validation summary. The other thing I might want to do is I might want to style those error messages a certain way. So let me go on my style sheet and make a class for error. Do keep in mind, as I said last time, that there really is a lot of ways that you could do this as far as what technology you, uh, you use. So I'm making the color a shade of red and I'm making the font weight bold. Again, it's a good idea to not 
just use color to distinguish an error? Because if someone's colorblind, then they, they won't see it. Or they might not notice it um, uh, as well. So therefore, I'm using a combination, in this case, of color and I'm making the font bold. That way it stands out two ways for someone that can see colors. For someone that's colorblind and can't differentiate between the colors, it, it at least shows up the one way. All right. Questions. And again, in this case, the hook sort of that I'm getting to uh, on the air message to put the style is there's an attribute on there for the CSS class. So once I, because I can then assign a CSS class to that, I can go in and, and define the CSS class and it'll have it. Yes? Uh-huh. Yeah. What what you would do? Yeah. What what there actually is is there's actually two, um, two things associated with an error. There's an error message and there's a text. All right. If you only put one of them in, it uses the same for both. If you don't want, let's see. Let's put the summary back up to illustrate. So, I could do something like this, and for the text I could put in an asterisk, or just something that really doesn't take up a lot of space. And then when I run this, if I get an error, it shows the asterisk in the text, so it shows the text for there, and the error summary, the validation summary, it shows the error text. If I omit the one, then it uses the error text for both. Now, if I literally put nothing in there, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Let's, let's find out. So, in other words, if I put a space in for the error text, I am not... No, if I put a space in there, you see it thinks that I want to display the error text. So you have to put something in. We might through code to be able to wipe it out if that's a, a big deal. All right. Next thing we want to do, I think, is we want to indicate whether it's right or wrong. All right? Now, we can do that via a label. All right? And I'll put that there. And I will call this LBL results for lack of a better answer better name. And the text I will give nothing to in ad, uh, initially. That way, um, that way, um, you know, when it first loads, it doesn't say that they're correct or incorrect. It just doesn't show anything. When I click the button, sometimes I want to show it to be uh, correct. Other times I want to show it to be incorrect. I therefore need some programming logic to check that and, and see if it's correct or not. All right. So, this is where we're going to put our first sort of scripting in here. All right. I'm going to double click on the button. When you double click on a control, it brings up a default method for that control. In other words, what do you typically do with buttons? You typically, most of the time, you're interested in what happens when you click them. So therefore, when I double clicked on the button, it brought up in the code behind file a protected subroutine for button click. This is the button click event. It handles the event of that button being clicked. Now, when does this code run? This is important to understand precisely when this code runs. This code runs 
when the button has been clicked and it makes it back to the server. So this code is going to run on the server and if the button was clicked before it got to the server, then this code is going to run. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to test the value of that text box to see if it's 12, right? That's the right answer, right? And if it's correct, I'm going to display in the label, correct. If it is incorrect, I'm going to display incorrect, all right? Now, these controls on the page are objects. What does it mean when we call something an object? What, what is an object? What are, what are some things that we can say about objects? Objects are code that represent something else in general. All right. Objects are created from a class. Think of a class as being a template All right. that describes the different things that are available on an object. Let's take a sort of an abstract example, and then we're, we'll bring it. We'll bring it around to, um, to 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 this. Okay, if I talked about a class as being a human, okay, I could say some characteristics that every human has. Right? Every human has a birth date. All right. Every human has a height. Every human has a weight. All right. Those are all characteristics that every person has. Now they'll have different values for it, right? You know, no two people in this room are likely to have the same birth date or height or, or weight. But we all have a value for one of those attributes. All right. In addition to attributes, there are certain behaviors that as humans we participate in. Right? We sleep. We eat, and so on. All right. Classes define the attributes or the qualities or the characteristics that a class of things have in common. All right. In addition, they, it describes the behaviors that that members of that class engage in. Another class might be students. You know, every student has a name, every student has an address, every student has a student ID number. Those are the attributes associated with that student. In addition, students can engage in certain behaviors. Students can enroll in a class, they can drop a class, they receive a degree, they receive a grade, and so on down the line. So, in our framework, the components over here are the classes, right? In other words, two text boxes are going to have the same things associated with them, right? The same characteristics associated with them. The specific text box that I drag onto my page or that I put in is an object. It's an instance of that class. For example, if humans would be the class, each one of us would be an object because we're an instance of the class human. You're an instance of the class student. Well, this specific text box is an instance of the class text box. So the text box class is sort of the template for all classes. It describes what are the properties of a text box. What are the things that we can do with the text box? All right. It's sort of like saying that book is a concept, right? You know, in an abstract sense. You know, we can talk about a book and we can say every book has a title, every book has an author, every book has a publication date, versus this is a book. This is an instance of that class that has a specific value for the title, specific value for the author, and so on down the line. So, what we want to do in our code then is our code is going to access 
and allow us to manipulate different attributes of the controls or the objects that are on our page. Now, this is where the IntelliSense comes in very handy because if we're not sure of an attribute, we can sort of scan the list and find it. So, what I want to do here is I want to put some code in to check to see if the value of that text box is 12. So, if. Now what was the name of that text box? I think it was txt answer. I can't say this. If text answer equals 12. Because I'm comparing an object that has a bunch of characteristics with a specific value. That would be like me asking, is a student 555-126-3794? Well, what do I mean? What am I asking about that student? Am I asking what their phone number is? Am I asking what their student ID number is? Am I asking what their social security number is? So I can't just say if the object equals that value, I have to point to a specific attribute. So maybe I could say, is the student's phone number equal to 440555 whatever. In this case I want the value of that text box. I want the value of the number or word or whatever that's typed in that text box. And that is the text attribute. All right. Now, I, I think you've all said that you've done Visual Basic, although some of you have said maybe it was a while ago. All right? An if statement is an example of a conditional where you're testing something and that's either true or false. In this case, I'm testing is the text in that text box equal to 12? If so, then I want to do something. If not, then I want to do something else. So again, it's a branching. This is true, do this, otherwise do that. So what do I want to do? Well, all I said I wanted to do is just display something in that label. So I will say label, what do I call that label? I, I think I forgot to ch LBL results, very, yeah. It wasn't showing that. LBL. There we go. If it matches 12, then it's correct. Otherwise, it is incorrect. All right. Now, let's review this. What is text or te txt answer dot text? Well, we have the object and we use that dot notation. Everything after the dot is going to be a property of that object. So this is the text property of that text box called answer. Is that equal to 12? If it is, then we're going to set the text property of the label called LBL results. We're going to set it to correct. Otherwise, we're going to set it to incorrect. Okay? Now, here's the thing to keep in mind. These properties that I'm changing through the code are the very same properties that you get when you set it up. In other words, label results has a text property. And I set it to nothing initially. 
now, once they've tried the question, I'm dynamically setting it to true, or, or I'm sorry, not true or false, correct or incorrect, based on whether their answer is correct or not. Okay? So, all these different properties for all these different controls that you can see. Alright? So let's look at that, this label. All these different properties I really can set two ways. One way is I can set them initially in the code, all right, through the properties window here, or by putting in the properties this way. A second way I can do that is I can set those properties via my code behind. And I do that when there's some sort of logic. In other words, I don't always want to set the, the value of the label to something. I want to set it to something depending on whether they got it right or not. This is a little different than this label, right? That's always going to be 7 plus 5 equals, right? That label always has that value. All right, so now let's run this and let's see if it works. Okay, so now, validation still works, right? And if I put in the right answer, it shows me that it's correct. If I put in the wrong answer, it shows me that it's incorrect. All right. Now, keep in mind again, when does this code run? Oops. This code runs on the server side, so when that button is pressed and it makes it to the server, it's going to run that code. Now with buttons, that's less of an issue, right? Because clicking a button sends it to the server. So I know when I press that button, it's making it to the server. Later on, we'll look at some controls where we're going to write some code for them, all right? But we have to make sure it gets to the server before the code gets executed. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. Now, how do you suppose I could make it so that it showed correct and incorrect differently depending on, you know, it, it, the style of it was different depending on whether it was correct or incorrect. So I want to make, you know, maybe I want to make the correct be... Um, bold and white 
and I want to make the incorrect, or we'll make a bold and green, and I want to make the incorrect italics and um, red, for lack of a better color. One way to do it would be two results labels. Okay? So I could make two results labels, and I could apply a style on those, and I could show and hide the result labels depending on, on um, what I wanted to do. I'm going to do another approach, though. All right? Yeah. Did you have your hand up? Or? No, you can set the other properties. Yeah, you can set the other properties. And specifically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a correct and an incorrect class. And for the correct class, what did I say? I said the color is going to be green and the font weight I'll make bold. And for incorrect, I was going to make the color red. And the font, no, what is that? That's text decoration, I think. Ooh. Better look this one up, eh? CSS italic. Font style. Yeah, I can tell I don't use that one that often. All right. Now, I can go in here and I can say label results dot. Do I have a hook into the CSS class? Well, I sure did before, right? CSS class equals correct. Incorrect. And now when I run it, um, it should do the styling the way that I want it to. Question. Why did I choose to do it this way as opposed to setting the individual attributes? I could have set the attribute of the label to be red and, and all that. Why did I take this approach? Yeah, I could, yeah. What's, the, what's the answer to all my questions? Maintainability, right? Now I can make sure it's consistent between pages if I had other quizzes like this. I can also, by assigning it a different class, I can instantly change as many properties as I want, as many properties are related in the CSS rule, as opposed to, to piecemeal assigning the, the, the properties one at a time. Oops. Alright, there's correct. And there's incorrect. All right. Next we want to do is we want to be able to show the answer. Okay. So.
Well, I might do something like this and I might create a paragraph. And inside that paragraph, I might say, Now keep in mind I could do this a couple different ways. This is just the way that I'm thinking of doing it. I'm creating that label. And I'm going to go in the properties of that label. And I'm going to set the visibility to false. All right. Then I'm going to put a button on here. Let's go here. And it's text I'm going to make show answer. And I'm going to double click on it. By doing so, that's going to take me into the code behind. Notice we're now in that other file in the code behind. And we have a button one click event. I can go and I can make that answer visible. So I can say LBL answer dot visible equals true. Okay. So now I can run this and based on, initially that will show up as invisible, and then when I click on it, it'll become visible. Now, I'm going to have a question for you in a minute here. Because I've done things two different ways here. All right? And well, let's go back and let's revisit the, the two different ways that I've, I've choose, chosen to do it. In one case, I've chosen to change the appearance of stuff via CSS. In other words, the, the uh, error message. All right. I um, gave two CSS classes, one for correct, one for incorrect. Not, not the error message, but the results. And then I apply the proper style and that takes care of it. I could have done the same thing with this. I could have created the label, all right, and I could have made it invisible through the CSS code, all right, and then when they clicked to show the answer, I could have changed the CSS class to make the text visible, all right. Oops. The correct answer is 12, all right. Now, why did I do it one way in one case and one way in another? Part of the reason I just want to show different ways to do it. So there's that. But there's a pretty good reason why I would not want to simply make this label invisible via CSS. In other words, put a, put a, a label in there and make it invisible via CSS and then make it visible again. Any idea why? Well. I'll tell you why. If I would have done it that way, the label, the text of the label would have been in the HTML code. It just wouldn't have been able to see it. If I make the label itself invisible, then the server does not send that over to the browser. So if you had a smart first grader who wanted to cheat on his addition quiz, if we did it the first way, where we did it via CSS, the text of that label would be in the, in the source. And that person could do a view source and see what the answer is. Here, by making that invisible, um, by making the, the, the ASP.NET control invisible, then the browser doesn't, I'm sorry, the server doesn't, doesn't send it to the client.
for the um, so it can't be viewed as part of the source or anything. There's some so so again, you know, that there's there's a number of ways to do things, whether it be through traditional web languages like CSS and, and so on, or um, through by setting the ASP.NET properties. And sometimes there's implications to that. Sometimes it's six of one, half dozen the other. It really doesn't matter which way you do it. In this case, I do want to demonstrate, and I'm going to put in a request for a faster computer in here. People watching the video at home probably think that the that the YouTube video stopped loading or something, you know. They're going to be calling Time Warner or someone and complain about their internet connection. If we look now at view source, we'll notice that we do not have in there the label answer. Because by making that label invisible through the ASP.NET properties then, the server doesn't deliver that as part of the HTML. Whereas if we made it visible in, uh, through those properties and made it invisible via CSS, it would send it to the client and then make it invisible on the client. Now, there's one more thing I want to cover today. All right, and then we'll set up the cliffhanger for next time. All right, and the one thing I want to handle is... <coughs> That one thing that you should do on all your button click events is any code that does processing, you should surround with an if statement that looks like this. If is valid. Now, what does that mean? Let's, let's analyze that for a second. First of all, if you notice, I had never declared any variable called is valid, right? That's actually a built-in property of the page, right? Remember we talked about classes and we talked about properties? Actually, there's such a thing as subclasses as well, where a class gets all the properties of its parent class. In the .NET framework, there's built in certain attributes for certain kinds of things. And for pages, there's an is valid attribute that's just built into the framework. Now that attribute will be true if all the validation controls passed. And it will be false if one of the validation controls failed. Now, we have client-side validation enabled on my browser. That means the validation is occurring on the client side. So it never makes it to the server, all right, unless it's valid. So in this particular case, in this particular configuration, with client side scripting enabled, that if statement really doesn't have an impact. However, if we were to disable JavaScript, all right, then the validators would fire off on the server side and that if statement would prevent any calculations from occurring if the code wasn't valid, if, if the, the form wasn't valid. So you kind of put that in just sort of as a safety net um, to keep it from trying to do anything if the errors are caught via server side validation. All right. Really no impact otherwise, but again, that's, that's what that does. So it's good practice to put that code in there if is valid and just wrap that around the, uh, the whole code that does the processing of the page. Now, we might do a little bit different than I had planned originally, but next time, you're all familiar with your first assignment. And your first assignment was to create a web page that had three sections, I think, on it. A section for H um, no, 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 not HTML, wrong class. ASP.NET, a section on 
SQL, and a section on database design. Now you might very well have designed the page to look like this, roughly, if that's going to be the wireframe, where you have a div, a section of the page for ASP.NET, a section for SQL, and a section for design. Think about how we could do this. Make so that there was one page and there were buttons on the side of the page and when you selected a button it showed you that section. So if you selected ASP.NET it would show you ASP.NET information. If you selected SQL, the ASP.NET information would disappear and the SQL stuff would appear there. If you click database design, then database design stuff would be there. You should be able to do that with the stuff that we did today, but the use of the panel will make your life easier in doing this. Okay? And that might be where we'll start um, on Thursday is, is take a look at, at that example and see how we could rewrite it to, to work in this model as opposed to showing everything at once. All right? Questions? All right. We'll see you up in lab. I will make sure I upload this and then upload the video shortly, um, you know, later today.